all of the um, materials in that uh, exhibition are uh, materials that we actually have on site um, at the Home Museum and Manuscript Library in Minnesota. Um, so what part of what I'm doing in the, the talk today is um, exploring some of these, these themes that are in the exhibition, but uh, sharing some examples of um, you know, other examples from beyond our on-site collection, uh, because uh, if you uh, if you know much about the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library, then you know that um, a lot of our work is, uh, you know, starting uh, decades ago with microfilms, and then uh, now with digital photography, uh, we are um, photographing and making copies of manuscripts from elsewhere in the world uh, that we then share and make available on our website. So. Um, I'm going to show some other examples from uh, the many collections that we have that are uh, all over the world and kind of um, you know explore some some additional aspects of of uh, um, of the themes that that we're talking about and um, and I also want to uh, at, towards the end of the presentation I'll kind of dig into a specific genre of book that um, didn't really have the chance to uh, include in the the physical or online exhibition but. Um, I think is a, a pretty interesting one to explore. So, um, so let's dive in, uh, and I'll start um, first of all with, with the yeah here um, with this uh, image. This is uh, something that I this, this is what what I included as the kind of uh, display image for the um, for the presentation. This is a manuscript that's in Mosul, Iraq, um, and it's uh, it's a poem. Um, you can see one side of the, the image, it's in French. Uh, the other side is in um, what we call Neo-Aramaic, so a kind of modern Aramaic dialect that's spoken by um, people in Southeast Turkey and Northern Iraq. Um, and uh, this, so this poem uh, was written by a Dominican missionary uh, from France who, um, worked in, in this region, this kind of mountainous region, Southeast Turkey, Northern Iraq, uh, where there were a lot of um, Assyrian and Syriac Christians. Um, and so uh, he he wrote this poem as a kind of um, apologetic to try and convince these, um, these people to uh, convert to Catholicism as a, as a missionary, naturally. Um, but uh, this, this particular manuscript, he actually wrote um, in kind of uh, a nicely decorated style uh, and um, at least in, intended to present it to the superior general of the Dominican order uh, back in Rome, um, as we can tell by uh, some, some of the dedications that are on other pages of this, of this book. Um, and this was in the late 19th century. Uh, now, I don't know if it, for some reason it never made it to Rome or uh, if the superior general died before he could present it to him or, or you know it's it's hard to say what exactly happened it, it ended up staying in Mosul um but uh you know you can see he's got he's working with multiple audiences here he's he's theoretically writing this poem to to convince um these Chaldean people that they should become Catholics but uh at least in this copy he's also kind of reporting back to his supervisors and saying like you know, look at this nice stuff that I'm doing here. Look at this nice poem. Uh, you can read it in your French language too. Um, and so, you know, in the in this case, he's he's kind of got this these multiple audiences in view. Um, and you know, that's why we've got this this kind of beautiful display of these two languages side by side here. Um, now, uh, and he also includes this nice map that kind of uh, is a a very sort of uh, you know imperial missionary survey of uh, ethnic and religious groups in the region where he's working. So he's he's kind of marking out, you know, the, the different territories and who who he's interacting with um, and saying, like, these are these are the kind of people that that I'm here working with. And so, you know, you back in France can also know where are them, where are the Nestorians, where are the Chaldeans, where are the Jacobites, the, all these different groups. Um, so I I think it's a really, uh, really beautiful uh, manuscript. And I think that, uh, um, you know, it's just kind of an interesting example of this, like someone who's you know, walking these between these different worlds where he's he's gone out from 
uh, from his home country to live in this region for most of his life, um, but he's still maintaining these close ties um, back to Europe. So from here, I'm going to dig into these different um, themes, the same ones that are on the online exhibition. Um, and like I said, I'll show you some kind of uh, different examples of, of things in these categories. So um, the first one is these, uh, these kind of teaching texts. Um, and, um, you know, these are things like grammars, like dictionaries, various, various texts that are meant to help people who speak one language to understand another. So what I want to emphasize with this image here is that this is not at all a new um, phenomenon. This is not a modern phenomenon, um, but this this image is actually from a Syriac Arabic dictionary that was written in the 10th century. Uh, this copy is from 1313. Um, you can probably tell, even if you don't know these languages, uh, you can see there's kind of uh, parts of it are in a, a more kind of angular, uh, thick script and others are in a more kind of flowing and curvy script. Um, well, that first one is Syriac and the second one is Arabic and I'll kind of highlight that here. Um, now, it's not always that easy to tell because sometimes people copy this text um, and they write both languages using the same alphabet. They, uh, generally, they would write the, the Arabic using the Syriac alphabet um, because uh, that is um, a pretty common phenomenon with Middle Eastern Christians. They they use the Syriac alphabet for a variety of languages, which we'll see. Um, and but uh, in this case, they used uh, the kind of typical Arabic alphabet um, that most Arabic speakers today are more familiar with. Uh, so it's easier to see the difference. Um, but this this kind of text comes out of um, the the sort of famous uh, translation movement uh, that was going on in in like ninth, 10th century um, around places like Baghdad and other major cities of the early Islamic world. Um, and uh, a lot of this, you know, the, the, these were people who were translating um, mainly classical Greek texts uh, into Arabic um, and uh, they were um, they were in many cases they were Syriac Christians and so in some cases there were uh, there were actually Syriac uh, translations of these texts that already existed or that were being created um, and so people uh, would um, would have a lot of need to know okay the, if I if I see this Syriac word you know that that is in one of these kind of Greek philosophical or scientific texts um, I need to know some of the good ways to, to render that into Arabic. So this is kind of um, helpful for these people who are uh, connecting these different cultures and these different languages. Um, and so, uh, you know, this is a, a very helpful, um, a very helpful object for, for anyone who is, uh, you know, is involved in this process and is, is kind of like making these connections. Um, so, you know, like I said, these these kind of uh, you know scholarly efforts to to understand and, and teach these different languages are are nothing new, but this is something that goes back many centuries. You know, a lot of the the best early dictionaries and grammars of Arabic um, were uh, you know written by people whose first language was not Arabic, whose like first language was Persian, for example, um, because they uh, they wanted to um, you know a, as a kind of second language learner they they had the the experience and the understanding of how best to kind of think of and, and understand and, and communicate uh the way that the that the language works um so this is an example of a teaching text that's very old we've got um here we've got a a, a more modern uh 18th century book um this is a grammar of the kurdish language uh which is mostly in italian um, and uh, you can see on the right page here, someone has, uh, or I should say the author has, has included the, um, the Lord's Prayer in uh, Kurdish, kind of transcribed into the Roman alphabet, um, and then also in Latin. So most, most of the book is in, is in Italian, but as we'll see with many of these um, books that we're looking at here, uh, you know, there's, there's a sort of a sense of 
of Latin and, and other languages as a as a sort of sacred language where you um you want to you know to include it in that language rather than um rather than in the the kind of vernacular Italian. So um so they include the Lord's Prayer there. And then you'll notice on the left page here that um someone has recording gone through in progress this vocabulary list. list. Uh, this vocabulary list that is in Italian and Kurdish, someone has gone through, uh, as this book has made its way to, to Mosul in Iraq, that someone has gone through and um, written uh, equivalents of almost all of these words in uh, their own Neo-Aramaic uh, dialect. So you've got, uh, you know, what ends up being kind of a composite uh, print with manuscript book uh, that, that has... Um, really four different languages going in it, if you count Kurdish, Italian, Latin, and this Neo-Aramaic. Um, then, uh, you know, we've got some some really impressive efforts at, at this kind of uh, multilingual work, like this um, dictionary by Victor Letelier of, uh, as he says, uh, uh, Persian, Tatar, Turkish, Georgian, and Armenian, all in one dictionary. And he says that it's for the use of travelers in Asia and Constantinople who are familiar with one of the languages, French, Russian, English, or Latin. Uh, so he's got all nine of these different languages uh, kind of interacting in complicated ways throughout this dictionary. Um, and the idea is if you know one of these European languages, this book should be able to help you understand uh, one of these uh, Asian languages, as he says. So. Um, you know, we've got some very impressive efforts to kind of uh, bring together as many languages as possible and help people understand uh, the diverse the diverse communities that they're interacting with. Um, so then the second theme is this kind of, uh, you know, diving deeper into these texts where you're doing real kind of scholarship on them, trying to, trying to understand and, and uh, um, you know, once, once someone has already understood these languages, how do you kind of, um, you know, understand the text, or how do you just kind of collect things that are that are interesting to you as a scholar? Um, so this is something that you see a lot in the um, in some of the later uh, Islamic contexts. This is a commentary on uh, a text in one language, but the commentary is in another language. So we've got a, a Persian poem here, um, and then a commentary on it in Turkish. And as you see often in Islamic texts, the, there's a lot of Arabic in it as well. Arabic is the sacred language of the Quran, of course. Um, and then, uh, so, you know, you get lots of quotations uh, from the Quran here. So um, Arabic is in the green boxes, Persians in the orange boxes. That's the actual poem that's being commented on. And then everything else is kind of the, the basic Turkish text that's, that's being written about it. So you've got, you know, someone who wants to kind of bring, bring a text from one language into another. This is, a, you know, uh, an author who uh, lives in a uh, an environment that's primarily Turkish speaking in the Ottoman Empire, um, but there's these very famous uh, texts in Arabic and in Persian from from other kind of times and places in Islamic history, and so this author wants to kind of uh, bring that text to his community by um, writing this commentary where he you know, quotes the line, he gives a translation, and then he says, you know, "This is uh, this is what it means." I'm going to explain it. Um, and so, you know, you have this kind of, uh, deep, deep engagement with that text in a way that connects, uh, you know, people across different times and places. Um, then you've got really, you know, just kind of this, this impulse of, of collecting things where, um, you have scholars like this, you know, whoever copied this manuscript, they put, um, this early Christian uh, hymn called the Trisagion. They put it in eight different languages. So you can see them here, Latin, Greek, Armenian, Georgian, Persian, Turkish, Arabic, and Syriac. Um, all eight languages, all theoretically trying to capture this one text, um, but all of them are written uh, in the Syriac alphabet. So this is it's kind of uh, what, I, what I mentioned earlier. Um, this person obviously is much more familiar with the Syriac alphabet than any other. Um, and so uh, for that reason, uh, it makes the most sense to um, just write everything in that instead of trying to capture like, oh, well, I'm going to try to learn a few letters in Armenian alphabet or Georgian alphabet, you know, just just get the, the words as close as you can 
using uh, the alphabet that you know best. And that way you can actually try to kind of pronounce the words uh, in your own uh, language. And, you know, we've got similar things. This is a, you know, this previous one would be a, a Christian scribe um, copying a Christian hymn. But then here we have uh, a Muslim scribe, uh, an actually uh, a Turkish speaker um, from probably from Ottoman Hungary uh, in 1589. And uh, for whatever reason, this scribe was was interested in um, a lot of the Christian texts that were being uh, used by his neighbors uh, in this region. And so he copied, uh, among other things, the Ten Commandments, um, I think the Lord's Prayer, a few of these kind of foundational Christian texts. And he copied them in his own Turkish language and then also in Croatian, Hungarian, German, and Latin. Uh, which he uh, mistakenly calls Italian, but um, this is a this is an ex extremely rare uh, kind of um, manuscript that you know that these these uh, these languages are almost never kind of brought together in this way. Um, but this person wanted to understand, you know, what's what's going on with uh, all of these different communities around me, and so um, I'm just going to try and uh, collect collect these texts and put them in these different languages and, and compare and contrast and, and we can get a kind of better idea of what's going on around us. So um, real interesting kind of uh, collections here. And then you've got something like this, which is just literally just a collection of over a hundred languages um, from around the world. Um, a sh just a short one page uh, excerpt in each one written in their different scripts. Um, Many in many cases, it's the Lord's Prayer that they try to capture. In other cases, they maybe couldn't find that, and so they just, um, you know, collect something that you know some little little text or something that doesn't even make any sense, maybe, uh, but just kind of gives you the sense of the letters. Um, there's a there's an example very similar to this in the uh, online exhibition. Uh, if you check it out, it's um, there's a text by uh, a manuscript by someone named Daniel Dixon, which is called a collection of the um, languages of the world. Uh, and he was actually a student from Cincinnati who studied in Rome uh, and, and wrote this manuscript in 1855. And this is from Rome in 1861. So there was something, uh, you know, something was causing people to, to kind of, um, you know, the, the modern kind of uh, imperial world or, you know, whatever it was, people were very interested uh, as they were studying in Rome to kind of get a sense of um, what's actually out there and just kind of collected in a in a uh, like aesthetically pleasing way. Um, so uh, then a, another theme here is these um, is the idea of kind of a classical language or a scholarly language, um, kind of a scholarly lingua franca. We've got all sorts of really interesting examples of this. Um, this is a manuscript that uh, includes a t it's a text by Ibn Sina, uh, also known as Avicenna, a very famous. Um, 10th and 11th century Muslim philosopher, um, but it was translated into Syriac. So he wrote it in Arabic, uh, a very famous Syriac scholar in the 13th century, translated it into Syriac. Um, and then this copy was made with the kind of parallel columns. So Syriac on the right, Arabic on the left in 1972. So um, this is, a, of course, a very recent uh, manuscript, but someone, uh, you know, at this monastery in southeast Turkey was um, continuing to you know to produce these manuscripts um, and uh, and and made this this copy of this kind of classical text and it I think it's interesting because it's got it, it's like the the classical language of the Islamic world of, of of you know so much of Islamic scholarship and then the classical language of so much of Christian Middle Eastern scholarship in Syriac. Um, are kind of brought together here. Uh, you know, both of these were kind of like scholarly dialects that that uh, you know people on the street were not really uh, speaking exactly, but uh, um, but they they became this kind of shared language that scholars could communicate in the way that European scholars at a certain time would have all learned Latin, uh, you know, to engage with each other across language boundaries and that sort of thing. Um, and as I mentioned here, you can see that the, the Arabic, again, is written in the Syriac alphabet. So we call that Garshuni, um, but 
yeah, as I said, very common, um, easier to just read them both uh, in the same alphabet uh, in some senses. So um, yeah, another example here uh, is a, a Persian um, text that collects biographies of poets who wrote in Urdu um, along with examples of their poetry. So, um, you know, we have this Urdu selection here right in the middle of this Persian text. So, you know, in in early modern India, Persian became kind of a classical language. It was like the scholarly, courtly language that people would write in uh, for, for literary purposes. Um, and then, uh, you know, this person is kind of capturing some of the, the vernacular poetry as well in, in this Urdu language. Um, yeah, and then similar to this, you know, scholars might use some sort of classical lingua franca to communicate. In a similar way, you might have a language that takes on kind of a sacred role um, because it's the way it's the way that we that a community um, does their rituals together. They pray together in this language. They meet in a church or a mosque or a synagogue, and they. Um, recite uh, prayers and, and sacred texts in this language. And so it becomes the the way that they uh, kind of, um, get beyond their everyday speech and think of their you know, connection to the divine in some way. So this is uh, one of the very first, uh, this is possibly the first Arabic script um, book printed outside of Western Europe. Uh, and, and it was actually printed in... Um, a monastery in Romania in 1701. Um, one of the uh, there was uh, this this Antim the the Iberian Antim Iberiano had had was a real pioneer in printing technology in Romania, and some of the Christian leaders from the Middle East came and um, kind of interacted with the the rulers there. And and uh, in the in the course of those visits, they um, were able to get some books printed. And you can see here it's side by side Greek and Arabic. Uh, so, you know, Greek was a very important historic um, language of liturgy for a lot of Christian communities in Eastern Europe and the Middle East. Um, but, you know, Arabic would be the, the language of, of everyday interaction uh, in like Syria and Lebanon. So this is, uh, you know, an example of, of this kind of sacred language uh, phenomenon going on. But you might also have, uh, in this case, a manuscript where someone is, is also copying Greek, but they chose to copy it in uh, the Arabic alphabet. So, you, you know, you continue to get these um, kind of surprising combinations of language and script and alphabet where um, where people are, uh, you know, they, they're, this person is more comfortable with the Arabic script. It's what they've seen their entire life, um, but, uh, you know, they wanna, they wanna include these liturgical texts and, and prayers in Greek. Um, and so they, just copy them out as best, you know, as close as they can get them in the Arabic alphabet. Um, so, you know, we have some interesting combinations of things like this. Um, and people are also, you know, beyond like interacting across communal boundaries, people are also interacting with diverse groups within their own community. You know, people are, are living in places where their neighbors speak five, six, seven different languages uh, you know, on a regular basis, you know, they're, uh, they've got, you know, four churches in the neighborhood that all have a different liturgical language that all, you know, kind of cater to different communities. You've got, um, you know, different religious communities with different languages. Um, and so you get really interesting kind of combinations of languages uh, that, that come out of these diverse environments. So, you know, this, this is a prayer book. Everything's written in the Syriac alphabet. But the text is actually in Arabic and Turkish, um, and it includes pretty liberal borrowings of Armenian terminology because they were living in a community that had lots of Armenians. So they, you know, they're constantly using um, things like the word "surp," which is an Armenian word for saint. Um, you know, it's a uh, you really get a sense of exact, you know, exactly what context this person is in because they're showing you so many signs of of you know, who's around and, and how they kind of understand that, um, that environment. Um, you also have, you know, kind of collisions of different cultures as you have 
you know, major geopolitical, uh, you know, shifts and things like that, where um, you have missionaries coming in and they're bringing things like Latin and French and they're, um, you know, interacting with people who speak Arabic. And so you get, you know, someone who collects a, a book of prayers and they include both languages and, um, you know, you have all these sorts of, uh, of fascinating interactions going on. And then you have like um, other books that that become multilingual, you know, maybe they were just one language when they were produced, but then you have, uh, you know, later readers, owners, you know, binders, whoever, whoever comes along and interacts with that book over later centuries, um, they might add things in, in different languages. So here, this is a Syriac gospel book. Um, there's a bunch of Syriac notes added at the end. There's also stamps in German by this priest named Samuel Gimish. Um, and, uh, you know, these come out of a context where Gimish was uh, living in Germany and gathering funds among the Syriac Christians there to help restore the church in the village they had all come from back in Southeast Turkey. Uh, and so um, he actually includes, there's a kind of pasted in, there's pages with lists of donors' names and how much money they gave um, from Germany, from Sweden, um, all from these Syriac communities, um, and it's all in modern Turkish. So you have all sorts of kind of uh, interactions with with the, you know, the rise of these migration and diaspora communities that um, are such a major feature of uh, modern Middle Eastern Christianity, so many of them live in um in different parts of the world um and have kind of had, had to figure out how to um to maintain that connection to their homelands uh, from abroad um you know here we have uh, an 18th century um arabic manuscript uh, but someone has you know you can see it's it's been damaged somewhat and so at some point someone had to come along and um put a new binding on it, a new cover to help protect it. Um, and what was available was this kind of cardboard um, advertisement for some sort of uh, like women's uh, clothing um, that had some text in French and Arabic. So you end up with like these kind of um, pastiche type of things where someone has, has put different parts together and come up with um, you know what's now a, a a manuscript book. Uh, this is a this is from from Ethiopia from an Islamic uh, community there. That's a um, it's a uh, legal commentary in Arabic, but someone covered it up in a like the cover of a planner um, with uh, text in English and Amharic, which it, Amharic is the main uh, kind of Christian language of Ethiopia today, um, and this is actually the cover that's on uh, that's on the front of it. So uh, someone has bound it in this uh, kind of fascinating, uh, yes, you know, I, yeah. dynamic, colorful planner um, that is a very fascinating contrast to the uh, you know Arabic legal material that's inside. Um, I love that one. Um, so as we have just a, a few more minutes here. Um, I want to focus on one kind of one genre, uh, a book that kind of interacts with many of these themes that are that are present in the in the online exhibition, um, and that's the the prayer book. Which you know, basically here we're talking about um, you know books that are designed for a person to use in a kind of private devotional setting. Um, and you know, you might think, well, if it's just one person who's kind of interacting with it in private, why would they? why would they not just use like their main language as the language instead of you know, as opposed to having multiple languages um but it's actually extremely common uh to have multiple languages in these kinds of books um you know uh we, we talked about liturgical languages and sacred languages earlier um i think the idea that uh that everything in a like religious ritual or, or a devotional practice um, should be kind of straightforwardly accessible in, a, in the vernacular language. That's a pretty modern idea. You know, a lot of people um, uh, over the centuries have, have um, done these kind of spiritual practices in languages that kind of stretch beyond what is their familiar day-to-day -day, um, existence. And so 
uh, that becomes a kind of um, unusual experience that that you know that helps them to um, to experience that that sort of devotional practice. Um, so, like I said, it's very common. We've got uh, an example here um, with mostly Turkish text, but at the bottom under this little heading, um, it's Arabic. And you, you may notice one difference between those two portions of text is the Arabic is much is marked up a lot more. It's got way more little markings. And those are um, basically uh, vowel markings to help you make sure to pronounce it correctly. So, uh, you know, the assumption here is that this is a, a person who um, knows Turkish well, can read Turkish, um, but they want to make sure that they are pronouncing everything in the Arabic uh, correctly, and it's less familiar to them, and so they mark it up in a lot of detail so that they, um, uh, so that they have, uh, you know, so that they can be sure that they're saying everything correctly. Um, so you get a real kind of personal glimpse into what kind of person had this produced and, and how were they using it. Um, we've got Arabic and Persian here where they've actually indicated the difference by kind of um, these middle line, these middle three lines here are Persian and you can see it's a, a little bit different script style, you know, where it's a little bit, you know, thinner and, uh, and more slanted. And that is kind of the, the visual distinction here. Um, we've got more examples of this. This is prayers in Arabic and Harari, which is the uh, native language of um, Eastern Ethiopia. Um, this is a Jewish example where it's, uh, it's a mixture of Hebrew and Aramaic. Um, so again, you've got that kind of sacred language with, you know, another kind of um, classical sacred language almost that, that, you know, has also at one point was the vernacular, but is now also kind of like another uh, sacred language. We've got, this is a, a Christian example where um, it's in Syriac and Arabic uh, and most of the prayers are in Arabic, but um, there's a more kind of liturgical text here at the end, which is actually for like the ordination of a nun. Um, and that's in Syriac because it's, you know, in this case, there's kind of a genre distinction where it's it's like for for the for liturgical practices like this, you need to uh, to use the, the sacred language of Syriac. Um, we've got, you know, again, kind of um, the, the arrival of missionaries where they, you know, this is a French speaking missionary who has come to the Ottoman Empire um, and they want to collect prayers and hymns in um, Turkish, uh, but they actually collect them in, you know, they, they write them down in the Roman alphabet, uh, which now is the normal way to write Turkish, but in the Ottoman Empire, that was uh, not the case. So this is, uh, you know, this is coming from, um, from from a context where autumn, where Turkish was usually written in the Arabic alphabet, so um, you know they're they're kind of writing this in a way that these Western European missionaries can understand more easily. Um, and then you know, in addition to the various languages, you start to get um, you know visual art as well that that connects to the language in interesting ways. You've got this geometric cross page here. Um, in a, in a book that also has many, many languages. Um, you've got something like this where it's a 15th century Arabic Turkish prayer book, but then there's this section at the top of the page here where instead of using any language, it just transitions into kind of um, letters and symbols and kind of, you know, the, there's a, there's a sense that um, these, these, designs have some sort of magical power where they kind of trans transcend language altogether. Um, and, you know, this is not something that you can like read or pronounce like a language, but it's, uh, it's something that that has power to accomplish, you know, whatever uh, kinds of things you're, you're looking for in your life. Uh, and so, you know, it, uh, they're, they're not only moving from, you know, their vernacular Turkish to the sacred language of Arabic, but they're also Kind of moving beyond language altogether and, and connecting it to these um, these kind of non-linguistic symbols here. Um, there's a particular kind of uh, grouping or genre of prayer books that is extremely common in the Ottoman Empire um, called the Anama Sharif, uh, which almost always has Arabic and Turkish um, 
and again, it's this kind of sacred language versus vernacular distinction where, um, you know, you've got chapters of the Quran and you've got prayers that are all in Arabic, but then you explain those prayers in Turkish so that people understand what they're, what they're saying and what those prayers can accomplish for them. Um, oops. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then you, you know, in addition to those, those multiple languages, you get the, the visual art as well. So you get, you know, things like this, where it's pictures of the sacred places, um, Medina on the left, Mecca on the right, uh, that help the, you know, the, the reader kind of is transported to those sacred places and, and, you know, and get a sense of what it's like to actually be there. Um, there's pictures of, of kind of sacred relics, um, that the, the reader is encouraged to, to kind of contemplate and, and connect to in their prayers, um, these are the, the handprint and the footprint of the prophet, which are again kind of powerful symbols of of connection to to the prophet um, that the the reader can um, can uh, you know connect to these things as they're as they're using the book. Um, you have calligraphy, like this is just the name of the prophet Muhammad, um, and uh, you know the these kind of beautiful designs of words help people too. Um, to think about those uh, those those prophets and those other characters, this is this is another calligraphy. It's not a prophet. It's actually um, this is from a section about uh, this famous story called the Seven Sleepers of Ephesus, which is a story about seven men who fell asleep um, for several hundred years, uh, woke up, you know, God God brought them back to life. Um, this is a kind of ancient Christian story that then appears in the Quran as well. Um, and so it has, you know, a calligraphy page for the names of each of these people, as well as this page, which is for their dog, um, their dog kind of guarded the entrance to the cave. So, you know, the, the, I think the weirdness of this story, uh, made it feel like, you know, that it was important and people should, um, should be paying attention to to what's in it and that the names of these of these kind of magical characters uh and their you know protective guardian dog um would also kind of have power to help protect people in their lives um so you get all sorts of these kind of um ways that people can can transcend like the normal day-to-day -day life um you get this which is called a hilya which is like a description of a prophet uh, in this case it's jesus um it's in Arabic and Turkish, but that helps you to kind of think about, you know, what Jesus looked like and how he walked and how he, you know, so that you can can get the without having an actual artistic figural representation of him, which would be very unusual in an, in a devotional um, text in the Islamic world. You get um, these kind of descriptions that start to like again bridge the gap between, you know, what is what is spoken language and what is an actual like physical image where. Um, this is like meant to to kind of put the image in your mind so that you can contemplate these these people and connect to them as you're praying. Um, and then lastly, there's this uh, this symbol called the eye upon God, the eye in all Allah, um, which uh, is pretty common in these prayer books and um, and really just completely bridges the gap between what is language and what is visual art um, because, the, the the main symbol here is the letter ayn, which is also the Arabic word for eye, uh, the eye that you see with, um, just like the word eye in English sounds just like the word for you know, the first person pronoun. Um, it also in the same same way in in Arabic and it, you know the um, the ayn is the name of a letter, but it also means eye, um, and then you know you have the the eye upon God and all of those words are kind of interacting and are interlinked here in this in this image with God's name right in the middle, um, and so the image kind of is meant to look like an eye, looking at God, um, and also like the letter I surrounding God and you've got all these kind of like fascinating interplay of of you know. It's a it's a picture, but it's also letters and it's words. And you even on the on the example on the left, you get um, a little number square where you've got this kind of powerful, you know, um, set of numbers here that that uh, that also have a kind of esoteric purpose. 
Um, and so this is, uh, you know, this is just really, I feel like, um, exploring the possibilities of um, the ways that multiple languages and then the ways that multiple languages can help you access you know, different kinds of knowledge, whether that's scholarly knowledge or you know, spiritual knowledge of some sort, um, yeah. can, can help you access different kinds of power, um, but then also you know, trying to find ways of going beyond spoken language in, in really creative and interesting ways. Um, I think uh, you know these books are really exploring all of the all of those different possibilities. And as I say here on the on the slide, you can see this this symbol is actually in the online exhibition in that same book that I mentioned earlier, the collection of ancient and modern, modern languages. Um, and it's in the example I showed earlier too from from uh, from Rome. Um, so somehow this you know maybe because these prayer books were in European libraries or something, but you know, these these young scholars in Rome were aware of this this symbol as like an example of what they called like an Arab charm or something like that. So um, they were uh, they were collecting it as an example of of the different kinds of languages and symbols around the world. Um, so I don't have anything to add beyond that. I'm uh, I'm happy to take all sorts of questions. Um, I think we're going to uh, you know allow people to raise hands. Um, we can uh, take questions in the chat as well. Um, but yeah, if there's anything you'd like to know more about from, from what I've shown you today or from the online exhibition, um, you know, very happy to, to hear what you have to say. <laughs>